Peter van Meijenhuizen from our the sister institute, the Yang Institute for Theoretical Physics, will give us a course. Uh, well, uh, I, perhaps I can describe it briefly as uh, physics for dummies. It will be a course on supersymmetry, supergravity, and superspace. So, Peter. Whether the particle has talked about exists or not. And I have absolutely 
no point of view at this moment whether they will exist or not. So what I will do instead, nature will decide anyhow, but even if physics doesn't work, and there's quite some chance that it's true, it still will remain in mathematics. I think a lot of modern mathematics is now based on all these words, of course, that people like Litten and Rafa and so they have made a living out of all that. So what I'm going to do, as I said, I'm now going to begin, begin and, and give you uh, the simplest model together with physical explanations. So that is the setup. Um, now, in doing so, and I have done this at last conferences before, I have, of course, acquired some wounds from the audience. Because when I talk, uh, especially when we reach Rasmus therapy and so, there's a lot of anger coming to the surface. <laughs> so I've decided uh, to think a bit about it. And I'm going to make the point that the kind of manipulation we do, as you usually hear mass conferences, admittedly are not, uh, well, they, you can define them quite well, but that's not the way you should define them. There's a quantum theory which supersedes the classical theory. My point of view is that the quantum theory is the real theory. The classical theory is an imperfect approximation of the quantum theory. Some people say the classical theory is the whole framework, and then there's a little extension called the quantum extension. But I take the opposite point of view. The whole thing is the quantum theory. The classical theory is a small reflection of it. And so when we reach points, and I, I will be open about it mathematically, where you say, well, I'm not sure that makes sense, then I will tell you how the quantum theory re resolves that. The applications in mathematics deal with the quantum theory. Uh, all the work of Witten, Rafa, and so on, not classical, that's quantum. So it's also more interesting, I think, for you when I do that. Now, since I want to be honest and give you really everything, I have to use some concepts and explain them to you, which you probably don't know. Probably half of you know about Hamiltonian methods, and it stops about there. And even that you may know a different bit from us. I'm sure you do not know the rock quantization, which is a very fundamental point, uh, approach in this framework. So I will have to explain that. Um, I will also use a method which goes back to Emmy Neutron, called the Neutron method. This is extremely important in whatever we do. And, uh, it's remarkable if you go through the history of the last century of fundamental physics, that several key discoveries were made by mathematicians. I mean, Neutron was, of course, a mathematician. We use it all the time. <coughs> game theory, in my opinion, was invented by Hermann Weyl, and he was a mathematician. Uh, Pauli was a famous physicist, and Hermann Weyl had no physical intuition, but he did invent game theories, and that's what we do all out here. So it's quite interesting to see how mathematicians can have input in physics. It's much better known, I think, what the input is of physicists into mathematics, because I'm telling you that. I think that there's a useful cross fertilization. <coughs> now, I have given notes, and I'm going to you everyone on the notes, but if you have questions after my talk, I'm, every morning I'll be a little bit earlier here because I have gotten the prime slot. I speak at 9 o'clock in the morning. The organizer told me this is the best slot. You can have this option. So. And I'll be here a bit earlier. If you have questions, then I'm willing to discuss with you before I start my 9 o'clock lecture. So, those of you we are so motivated that you can early can find me here. So I do most on the blackboard. I will do most on the blackboard. And uh, I also have to organize myself here. So the first thing I'm going to do is explain to you what supersymmetry is. Now. Here I must immediately tell you a few things which you probably don't know. We have two kinds of particles in nature. In 1896, the electron was discovered. In 1900, the photon was discovered. In 1914, the nucleus and the proton was discovered. In 1932, the neutron was discovered, and so on. In uh, here in Brookhaven, the J-Sci core was discovered. Uh, Last year, the last of the fundamental laptops was discovered, the tau laptop, the tau neutrino. So we have a lot of particles. It turns out, and I'm not going to explain that, that all these particles can be grouped into two classes, bosons and fermions. Now these are particles. You can see them in the laboratory. You make a picture, you see a track, so this is a particle moving. 
part is I described by field. That is since, I would say, 1926, when the Iraq started conversation upon the dynamics, the approach. So fields are very important. Now, a field you have an idea of. It's a function over a manifold. So if you have x, y, z, t for our real world and time, then a field is a function of x, y, z, and t. Later, I'm going to superspace, and then we will get antiquity coordinates as well as coordinates. But in the moment, I take order of field. So the question is then, how to describe particles by means of fields? And that we do through an action. And I will explain in a moment what it is. Let me first explain these two words. So I'm having a lot of anecdotes, and maybe there are too many, but you will tell me after. Bosons is called after an Indian physicist, Boson, who in 1924 uh, wrote an article which he couldn't get published. Uh, it was about that you have to treat bosons, as we are now called, particles, <laughs> which have integer spin for the physicist. Symmetrically. So later the idea came symmetric in the wave function, but he wasn't so far then. And the paper was so vague it was rejected all the time. So he went, that's what he did is he wrote a letter to Einstein. And Einstein said, well, that's a good paper, but he stretched out the most important stuff in the paper, wrote himself in what he thought it would be. Published it, wrote another paper himself, it was much better. And that is why these particles are now called Bose Einstein. They satisfy what's now called Bose Einstein statistics. That means things are symmetric. So as a result, the fields which we are going to consider are commute, commuting objects. So if you have a field for one boson and another boson and you write it in the Lagrangian, you can also write it like this, and there's no minus sign or anything, they just commute. So it goes back to 1924, and that is one class of particles we have. An example of these particles is, for example, a photon. The light you see here consists of little bullets that are on bosons. Two bullets, they're completely identical, so if you interchange them, you don't see the difference. That's the physical idea behind it. Now, fermions goes, is named after Fermi. In 1926, Fermi wrote a paper on helium atoms, and he wrote a very obscure little thing. And then the Rock was in Cambridge, England, who always wrote things in more theory, wrote another paper over it, much clearer. He didn't refer to Fermi, so Fermi wrote him a letter and said, this is not very elegant. By the way, I've read this history, and I sometimes think the attitude among physicists is a bit unelegant and a bit rough. rough. I think mathematicians have a much better uh, way of contact with each other, at least on the surface. But <laughs> the people in the old days were absolutely horrible the way they wrote about each other. It was really disgusting uh, thing. So Fermi uh, wrote, uh, to be right, this you're really not an ethical and the Iraq said, well, maybe I will write to you next time. And he did. So what they found out is that if you have electrons, and now these are fermions, the wave function has to be anti symmetric So you have two fields like this, and you do like this, and you get the minus sign. So fermions have fields which are anti commutes By that I mean if you take two such fields and you interchange them, you get the minus sign. Now, mathematics, of course, you're quite familiar with that. These are called, if you have numbers and you interchange, you get a minus sign. These are called Grossman variables. Grossman, I believe, lives about 1840. Uh, I have read mathematical anecdotes, uh, uh, histories, where it was said that he was an obscure high school teacher, but I've also seen books he wrote, which were very influential at the time. And for example, Mr. Fermi, when he was 18 years old, was told to study a book by Grossman because people felt that Fermi, who was studying things anti-Semitic, maybe the book by Grossman had some relation, as it does, because I'm showing you. So Grossman was not so unknown as people think. So, here we write Grossman numbers. And the fields, so I'll, I'll be more explicit in a moment. Now, if you have two kinds of particles, here is in class and here is in class, then it's very strange to believe that there might be a symmetry between these particles. They're very different. For example, bosons, you can all put them on the same place. For example, in laser, all the photons sit on top of each other, so they ha don't have to have space to sit out of each other's way. On the other hand, you have white dwarfs and other stars made out of neutrons, and they are all compact, but they can't get smaller because there is a minimum distance they, the, the, the different fermions need from each other. So, Fermions and bosons look very different. Yet, the idea that the symmetry between these two exists in nature is, of course, a very preposterous idea, and it may very well turn out that 
nature doesn't want that kind of thing. We as theorists have assumed this is true and worked out the consequences. And now, in five years, the laboratories will tell us whether we are right or wrong. Now, I wanted to also say a few words about symmetry. And you may feel this talk is getting nowhere because it gets simpler and simpler, but um, I'm hoping if I lost you already, then uh, I should stop now, here and then. Absolutely 
there, but no doubt, everything is understood. All particles which are predicted by the group, symmetry predicts many things, so have been found, except what you probably have heard, the Higgs boson, which will or will not be discovered in Fermi lab in the United States or in CERN. And now, why did I have such a long story? Well, first let me go on with a few statements. These space-time symmetries really deal with long distances. For example, uh, translations, if you see these, these, these things move, long they mean that you can see it with the naked eye. Of course, it can still be a fraction of a millimeter, but it's not long. These internal symmetries, usually you see them at very short distances. You can't see them in general with your naked eye, but... So, they manifest themselves at different length scales. The space-time symmetries are classical. By that I mean that until now, well, string theory claims it has solved the problem, but until now nobody has been able to combine the notion of quantum mechanics with space-time symmetries. That's called quantum gravity. The quantization of the gauge group of gravity. The gauge group of gravity is Poincaré, or Lorentz, and Poincaré, I think. Um, trying to combine the Poincaré group, which is the group of gravity with quantum mechanics, is one of the outstanding problems of this coming century. There's a proposal in string theory, but whether it's the right one, nobody knows. At least we have one model where you can do this consistently. On the other hand, the internal symmetries are completely quantum. Everything has been extended to the quantum level, and we know exactly how to handle that. And for that, we need quantum fields. So we have fields, but if you combine quantum against the fields, we have quantum field theory, and that is the model approach. Now, this was symmetries. And now, after 50 minutes, you probably appreciate what a drastic idea it is to assume that there's a symmetry between bosons and fermions. There's another drastic thing I'm going to do. I'm going to make a link between these two symmetries. I'm going to look at gauge theories. And gauge theories have parameters which probably you could say sit here. Now, parameter of a symmetry I will epsilon, denoted by epsilon. It can, for example, be the angle for the phase or one of the group coordinates of SG2 or such a thing. And now, instead of making it constant, I'm going to make it a function of space-time. So when I write x, I mean x, y, z, t in three to the one dimensions. In the model I'm going to discuss, it will be all in time, so epsilon of t. So then it depends on the coordinates of this space-time. So in that sense, I have a parameter from here which depends on the coordinates here. So I make a link between these two groups of symmetries. And that's what engage theory is. So engage theory links these two, at first sight, completely uncorrelated concepts into something where the parameter which sits here starts depending on the coordinates which belong here. A kind of rather complicated idea. And this, I said, was invented by Hermann Weyl, in 1928. Of course, great progress has been made by Maxwell in the 19th century and in the 20th century by Yang and by Institute, who did in, for these groups what Maxwell had done for this group. So you understand how important this work was. And since these are the groups which are nature, that's a complete description by symmetry of physics. Now, I'm now going to do supersymmetry, and it is another amazing thing. Supersymmetry has a parameter which sits here. So all these symmetries were symmetries by the parameter of sitting here, but supersymmetry sits here, and I will make it local. So here is usual symmetry, but here will be supersymmetry. Now I will start some real calculations. <coughs> so the first thing I have to do is describe the model. Now the model I want to have should have a bosonic field and a fermionic field. Now fields can have indices, they transform in a group, but the easiest will be to take a field without any index. So that's what I'm going to do. This is just called a scalar field. There's only one scalar field in nature, perhaps, and that's the Higgs boson and nobody knows it exists. So I may just picking the example which is not realized in nature, but it's mathematically the simplest. So I'll begin with a scalar field of phi. Now our world consists of 
three plus one coordinates, x, y, z, space coordinates, t is time. The simplest manifold is to make it as small as possible. Now, I could let it depend not on any coordinates, but that would be too simple. So the next case is all my fields will depend on t. So my bosonic field, quote, unquote, this is what people in physics call quantum mechanics, depends on coordinates t. Phi of t is a real function, commuting, you can differentiate it. Of course, you all know better than I do that in path integrals you don't have differentiable functions. But for what I do, I know that C infinity functions are dense in L2 space, so I'll take these functions. And this is the bosonic field. Now I have to introduce a fermionic field, because the two classes are part of the bosonic fermion. And a fermionic field should be anti commutative So the symbol I will use is the following, lambda of t. But here all hell breaks loose, because what do I mean by this? Now here, many mathematicians have written articles, constants and many others, which are physically wrong, and I will explain why they're wrong. But let me first say what I do. When I have lambda t1 or lambda t2 and so on, these are all Grassmann numbers. T1 just labels that it is a particular Grassmann number, T2 another Grassmann number, and these Grassmann numbers anti commute. But if you have that, then of course it's very confusing to see what you mean by a derivative. I will need the DDT of lambda of t, and you would like to describe this as lambda in a Riemannian sense. But the problem is this, and then the limit for delta t going to zero. The problem in this approach, of course, is that this and this Grassmann number are different. And in what sense can you say that two Grassmann numbers come, become more or less equal when they come close? They're all independent Grassmann numbers. They are not related to each other. So then this has no meaning. <coughs> this limit cannot exist. Now, the mathematicians who have grappled with this problem have the following solution. They say, some mathematicians, that lambda t can be written, for example, as an anti commuting number, 1, say, uh, <coughs> eta, this is a Grassmann number, times a function of t. And so if you write it this way, you can differentiate this function and all the usual analysis. And each time you have this eta in front of it. Now, an anti commuting number has the property that eta times eta is 0, because this thing is minus this thing, but on the other hand, this thing is equal to this thing, because you have to the difference, so eta squared is zero. So, it's clear that then this function lambda of t would be such that if you have two such functions, you get zero. And that means that you can't write any terms with powers of these fields in actions. So we don't like that. Now mathematicians have, of course, extended this to have several j's, and that is sum over j. Then physicists say, yeah, but wait. Now, here I'm going to say a word which for mathematicians will not mean much, but when you do quantum mechanics, you need loops, and in loops, you need each time such a new field. So physicists say, if you then go to n plus one loop, you again have that everything squares or multiplies to zero. Mathematicians say, yeah, but in any problem you do, you take n large enough so that you have bigger n than whatever you do. And physicists say, no, you give me first the n, and then I decide how high I go. There the confusion comes. So this is one approach. I'm not putting it down, but it just violates unitarity, as we call it. Now the other way you can do it classically is that you say this DDT symbol is just a map. A map from a Grassmann number into another Grassmann number. So you dispense with this kind of Riemannian notion. You just say it is a map from a Grassmann in space and linear vector space of Grassmann numbers into itself. And then you can set the whole formal thing. Mathematicians like this because it's well defined, but it's not very useful because sometimes we need still to invoke such ideas. And for this it's very hard to always first go back to a very formal approach and then try to justify what you always did with normal functions. So my point of view is a third approach. It's neither the <coughs> simplest approach, nor the formal approach, but for me, it's quantum mechanics which results it, and that is to say, with these things, I have calculational rules, and in the 
end, I use these things to compute real numbers, never anti graph variables. When I say the probability for something, then it is something like 0 0.702. It is not times the Grassmann number. So for me, Grassmann numbers will, in all the manipulation, I'm going to do here, intermediate tools to produce real numbers. And then the rules which I'm going to work with you through will be tailored along what we did for ordinary functions. Now, if you like, whenever I work, you can see when you think of this when you're conservative. You can think of this when you're real, uh, like do formal things, or you can think that it makes sense in the quantum context, and then you're really believing it by authority. But either way, it allows me to move ahead. Now, are there any questions? We, we feel free to interrupt. Uh, yes. Yes. What is a cross number? Okay. A cross number is an object. Let's call it. Uh, Lambda of T1. Search that if you have two such Grassmann numbers, one, this is one, this is another, that this is equal to minus lambda T1, lambda T2 T1. So uh, these are objects which have this algebra. Now you can multiply them and you can add them, so they form an algebra in a mathematical sense. And it's a commutative addition, which is a distributed algebra, not commutative, so in the case of the minus algebra. People have tried to exchange, uh, to generalize this instead of minus sign putting a phase in there. You get all kinds of extensions. But this is what Grossman wrote down. Um, now, there's of course many other Grossman objects in mathematics, not Grossman numbers, but you have Grossman algebra, which is something very different. I'm not, those of you who know about these things, I'm not talking about it. I'm taking the 1840 article of Grossman, in which two numbers. And you should make even call them numbers, you could call them objects, or so on. Things like this, they're in minus sign. So are you thinking of something, are you thinking of something like a Lie algebra? A Lie algebra satisfies that. Yes, uh, well, Lee very particular ones, but yeah. No, I, people have tried to write matrix multiplications for these things down, and you can do that. However, uh, for example, if I would write this, then uh, you could say, if this is a nut, well, if you have Clifford algebra and T1 is different from T2 to a different object, then the anti commutator can be zero. But then in Clifford algebra, the square of the thing is usually not zero, it's something else. So it's not a Clifford algebra. It is a formal object. And I think the representations of these numbers in terms of matrices, in the end, always suffer from this kind of problem. These matrices use their properties, and if it looks far enough in that particular representation, you come to contradictions for the applications one needs. You can set up mathematically consistent schemes which are physically not useful. So I should be quite honest about this. This is always the threshold. After this it gets much easier. But you have to believe that I'm working with Grossman variables which have these properties and which... Oh, I'm sorry. This, uh... Well, since it's two years old. On what? On these Grossman variables? When I take a derivative, something should depend on P. And the way I did it here is by factoring the anti commutation character into a thing which doesn't depend on P, which I don't differentiate, times a function P, which I can differentiate. Now, I should say, you could perhaps formally introduce an object, whatever it is, and DDT on it, give an only Grossman variable. And that was the abstract approach I mentioned. One can do that, and in fact, I think that's probably the best way for these lectures to think. But I mentioned you three different approaches, there are more. Um, the more you go into these approaches, in my opinion, the further you go away from the, the truth, if I may say. The truth is, so what I want to do is go with you the little steps in the algebra, and as I go along, my experience is people understand better and better what things mean, yes? Yeah, but if delta t gets very small, then the numerator should become also very small in order that this limit makes sense. Where was this? Did the person ask the question? Yeah. Do you understand me? Yeah. No. No. This structural number is totally unrelated to this. You cannot say that at 
they don't think at all that this in some the, 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 the size of this number that we call more or less equal to this. There's no such thing as a norm on Grassmann variable. There's no topology. For example, when we come later to superspace, I tried to do a lot of topology in superspace, and each time I did something, I found at the end of the calculation that I only got what I already would have gotten in the theory with our fermionic coordinates. So the topology only sits in the boson coordinates. The fermionic coordinates carry no further interest in topology. They are bookkeeping objects. Now, I personally think that superspace is an incomplete state. There should be topology in superspace, and I have, maybe if you want, I can make some speculation. I have ideas, and I've been working on this for years, but so far without success. But in the moment, superspace is, is a very strange object. Now, I mentioned superspace, but superspace has coordinates theta, which are Grassmann variables, just like lambda t1 is a Grassmann variable. And I'm using Grassmann variables because that's what seems to work in particle physics very well, but it is not excluded that there is a new concept in mathematics which has less trivial properties as far as topology goes. So any other questions? Now I'm going pretty far in these four lectures, so uh, you may think I will get nowhere. But um, what I'm going to discuss in these lectures is first supersymmetry. Now supersymmetry was discovered in 1972 by Wolf van Lichtman in the Soviet Union in a very incomplete paper. And then a year later, Agurat and Volkov, also two Russians, and wrote a sequel. Then in 74, West Zulino, two physicists from the West, wrote really the formable account from rigid supersymmetry. And in 1976, uh, here in Stony Brook, supergravity was invented, which is the gauge theory of supersymmetry. And then, afterwards, superspace was invented, which I will discuss. And then it was realized that supergravity is the low energy limit of superstring theory. So then we got enormous activity in string theory and superstring theory. In the last five, six years, the string community has come back to supergravity, which is now again all over the hot topic. And that often happens in physics, that you oscillate between uh, different descriptions of the same thing. So my aim is to discuss supersymmetry, supergravity, and superspace. I will not discuss strings. The reason is that for strings, strings are little pieces of wire which can move in time. So they have two coordinates. They have where you are along the string, and the second coordinate says what the time is when it is. So a space and a time coordinate. And I'm going to discuss only things that depend on one coordinate instead of two, namely the time. So I cannot, in these lectures, ideologically include string theory to bring me out of this simple cardinal. So I'm now going to introduce an action. Now an action in physics, Einstein, when he wrote his equation of general activity in 1960, wrote field equations, but Hilbert, another mathematician, by the way, invented the notion of action. An action was a thing, so that if you did the order of the variation principle, you reproduce the field equations. Einstein viewed it for a long time as a trick. He anyhow had a field equation. Why should he further write something else to get the field equation if he already had it? But physics later, under the influence of Feynman, and I should say early in Iraq, used path integrals, and in path integrals you need actions. Now, I'm not going to discuss path integrals here. Very fundamental concept. But action is very important. So an action is always the integral of a Lagrangian times the time. Now, this is this coordinate t, and we let it run from minus to plus infinity. And L depends on t. But L of t must be expressed in terms of the basic field. Now, there's an enormous interesting history, but the most simple thing is that there is a kinetic energy. And so I will take from my bottom field this term in the action. This is called the Klein Gordon action if you have more coordinates. It was proposed by Klein and Gordon around 1928 to describe the hydrogen atom, but when they worked that equation out, the energy levels that people have measured didn't come out right. Schrodinger had even, that's not well known, Schrodinger had already the Klein Gordon equation, but he was so disappointed that where he didn't publish it. Then Klein Gordon published it, so it's now called the Klein Gordon equation. Schrodinger had it first. But anyhow, later it was realized that it describes all the particles, like today the Higgs metal. So if you like, you can think of phi as the Higgs metal, which, uh, the Higgs boson, which uh, you hope to destroy. Now I need to write down the next term for the fermion, because I need an extra boson of fermions. So let me first 
to write the result down. Lambda of t and then lambda dotted. Now here, first of all, I do some things which I have in practice in the past seen people find reasonable. I will assume that phi of t is real. I could take it complex, but why not take it real? That is simple. But I will also will say that lambda of t is real. Now, that has no meaning if I don't tell you more for a Grassmann variable. So what I mean by this is that there is an operation called permission conjugation. And so for any particular value of t, like t1, I can introduce a system and a notion of permission conjugation so that this is the same as this. Some people like to call this complex conjugation instead of permission conjugation. They like to view permission conjugation due to its operator and complex conjugation due to numbers. But I will not make that distinction. Um, um, if I have now two objects, A and B, my definition of permission uh, conjugation will be that it's B dagger, A dagger. Now, you're quite familiar with this relation in the product of operators, but I'm also defining it for Grossman variables for no good reason. You can do it different. But many people get confused at this point. They say, why don't you define A dagger, B dagger for Grossman variables? But I do it, and it turns out you can do it, and in the end you get the same results. I'm not going to prove that, I just mentioned that. So I'm not going to do this. This is my definition. So sometimes people find E means by definition. Now, now you understand this factor I. Because if I take I, lambda, lambda dot, and I will omit writing the T sometimes, but I should, it's always a function T, and I take the dagger, then the i gets to minus i under emission conjugation. And the order of these things changes, so it gets lambda dot lambda. But now, if I interchange lambda and lambda dot, I get to get a minus sign, because this is a Grossman variable and this is a Grossman variable. And no matter what Grossman variables I have, if you interchange, you get a minus sign. So this is i lambda lambda dot. So under emission conjugation, this term is unchanged. Now actions should be real or permission. You may wonder why am I so sloppy that I don't distinguish between real and permission. The reason is that actions at the moment are numbers like phi of t, but later they become operators, and then I discuss the notion of reality become permission. So I will already anticipate that and not make much distinction between real and permission. Now this term is clearly real. Permission. And now this term is also real and permission. And now this absolute crazy idea will come. I'm going to write down a symmetry um, between bosons and fermions under which this action is invariant. Now here I have to explain something. An action having a symmetry was studied by Emmy Nurgen, 1927. You all know that article. And, I hope, and a symmetry leads to a, sim a, a conservation law, as you say in physics, or a curve, which is conserved. So the whole culture behind symmetries. So I'm now knowing that all that happens. I'm going to write down transformation rules, and then I do an order Lagrange variational principle on this Lagrangian, and to first order in the infinitesimal variation, I will require that the action doesn't change. Then I say and have a symmetry of the action. Symmetries of actions in the end become symmetries of things you observe in nature. I'm not going to explain that in great detail. But a symmetry of an action leads to observable consequences. For example, the symmetry which Heisenberg in 1928 had between protons and neutrons, in the end it makes that certain nuclei have the same energy, the same other properties. So symmetries in actions lead to symmetries of what you observe. So I'm going to try as a story model, this model, which is really, I couldn't think you could make anything simpler. I'm now going to try to find the transformation law, and then I'm going to vary the action S under that symmetry. I work it explicitly with you out, and I want to get that the variation of S is U. So first I have to find a small variation of the field. Delta phi of T. So given phi of T, I must figure out delta phi of T. Now, we are after the symmetry of bosons and fermions. In our model, we have one boson. 5 of t, one fermion, lambda of t. 
So the boson has to go into the fermion. So you need a lambda of t on the right hand side. But now there's something really wrong with this equation because on the left hand side you have the commuting object because if phi is commuting, then a little change of phi would be very pretty perverse not to take the same kind. It's a symmetry operation, it should have the same properties. So delta phi should be commuting. But lambda t on the right hand side is anti commuting. So you need somehow to restore what we in physics call statistics. So we need something further anti commuting. Now we could write here something anti commuting, but we only want this law. So this is given the left hand side. So then you introduce on the right hand side another Grassmann variable, epsilon, which is also anti commuting. Now if you have two anti commuting objects, and you have on another object, so let me say anti commuting A1 and anti commuting A2, then together they behave as a commuting object. Let me just prove that to you. Suppose you have two anti commuting objects and you have one commuting object, C1, then you can bring C1 past the A2 because I will use the rule that um, phi of t, lambda of t, is lambda of t, phi of t. Um, this is very natural, but you don't have to do it again. Very many people have written articles in the past where they took a minus sign here, and that's called a C2 extension, but let me not mention it. However, it's very natural to do this, because one particular function t could be a constant function, a constant function is a number. And for a real number, it's a Grassmann number, and Grassmann already said that should not change size. So I use the most simple thing. But at this point, and in fact, this is a lesson you'll see every step of the way I'm going until we reach all the details. There's every time an ambiguity, and it seems that the theory is not unique. If you work it out, in the end, you get the same thing. So this is a lot of definition. Then, if you bring the C1 through, you get this. If you now bring the C1 once more through, you get this. And now you see that C1 times this object is the same as C1 on the left of this object. So this object, in that sense, behaves as if itself is a commuting object. In other words, well, that's not. If you now would take a more difficult exercise, suppose you took a third anti-commuting object here, then if you bring the two anti-commuting objects past each other, you get a minus sign. If you now do the next step, you get a second minus sign. And two minus sides cancel each other. So again, you see that this object, if you view it as a bosonic object and a commuting object, it commutes with an anti commuting object. So the A1, A2 together behaves like the fine field. So this thing has the same statistics, as you say, as this thing. So in the sense of statistics that you have on the left and right hand side commuting objects and anti commuting objects, in this case, commuting objects we were forced to introduce a parameter epsilon. That epsilon will be this epsilon. Later we'll go into maybe the function of time, because I have no space coordinates in the third model. But at the moment it's a constant. Okay, so it doesn't depend on t, it's not different change. Now suppose you wanted to write delta lambda of t down, because what I'm going to do is order the ground variation, both of phi and of t, the variation is between phi gives variation of the action. Variation this term gives a second variation, and I will require that the sum of these two terms cancel. That's called a symmetry. So I must first write down for you a delta lambda of t. This is anti commuting. People try that, and you probably would do this. And now you see the statistic is wrong again, because this is anti commuting, this is commuting. So you would like to write an actual here. And I'm going in a moment to tell you this is wrong, and this is where general relativity is born. Now, a very amazing thing. You may think, how is it possible for such a thing to explain general relativity? We'll see that the theory of general relativity of Einstein, 1960, follows from these simple manipulations. I'm going explicitly to show it to you. Now, in order to do that, I first have to clear up things. Find the theme of real. <coughs> is the object real? No. Because I already showed you here that I needed an I if I have two graph of variables to make it real. So I'll add an I. Now this is already the correct rule, but we'll see that in a moment. The problem here is something very deep. It's so deep that the beginning people who did it didn't realize it. And when we started doing supergraph, we didn't realize it either, but we realized at some point that 
there is a property here which has to do with dimension. And the dimension leads to the theory of general relativity of gravitation. And we'll explain that Einstein's theory of general relativity is a consequence of supersymmetry. This I won't ask to explain to you. So I'm now going to explain the notion of dimension. Well, in this simple model, you may wonder, why didn't I write two time derivatives, lambda dot, lambda dot, after all, I wrote in phi dot, phi dot. If I want to make it symmetric, if I have two derivatives here, you should have two derivatives here. So, the question is, why didn't I do that? Uh, the physicists smile because they know very well, but the mathematicians may not immediately see it. It's the mathematician, the audience, who as a proposal why this is wrong. Zero. It's zero, yeah. Because this thing is minus itself. So the next simple thing is this. There have been people who do this. And it needs what technicians call ghosts. And it's not good. So <laughs> yes. now you may say, why didn't I do this? Well that's the same thing as interchange. So it's unique. I would like to stress that all the things I'm doing are unique. This is one of the wonderful things. It may be also our undoing. Because, because everything is unique. If exponents will disagree in five years with the predictions, all of the work is gone. And I will be gone too. So, <laughs> it is a blessing and a danger, all this uniqueness. Now, this, there's nothing else you can write down here in the system. But now I have to explain what is wrong with this equation. And for that I need dimensions. The dimension of a time coordinate, t, physicists give the dimension minus 1. Mathematicians, I will just introduce a notion of dimension. So I'm going to define things and then do completely easy. Then ddt will have the dimension of plus 1, because ddt of t is 1. And I will say that the dimension of a number, like 1 or 2, is 0. Naturally, you say that the number has no dimension. If I now look at this action, I have an apple and an orange, but they should have the same dimension, otherwise you can't add it. Now, the dimension of an action should be zero. The physical reason is that we have passing the very exponents of the action. We would like this to be dimensionless. But for the mathematician, I say I just define it this way. So there's a physical reason for it, it goes back to Feynman's 1960s paper. I'll define this. Uh, for the physicist, they, I'm aware that I showed an h bar. But for the physicist, I will say that for the moment I put h bar at 1. The mathematicians don't know what h bar is. They may wonder why you write an h and then a slash for the Well, that is to indicate that it is profound. But uh, <laughs> I'm not going to discuss it. So I'm aware of the h bar. Please respect me on this. So now the dimension s is zero, then I can divide, divide from here what the dimension of phi is. What is the dimension of phi? How many integral are some dimension? Ah. This dt in the integral. It is like a Riemann sum, so it is the same as t, so it is minus 1. And this linear? dt? No, the integral. The integral step, step, yes. The integral step, yes. Linear, but I won't know the dimension of 5. Who, who can minus tell me? Minus half. Sorry? Minus half. Excuse me? Minus half? Yeah. 5 is, let's do it together. So, <laughs> <laughs> 0. Now, dt was minus 1. Now I need the dimension of this thing. Half has no dimension. Phi dot, each has a ddt, but it has two ddt's. And a ddt at one, so it's 2. And then it's 2 phi's. Now, therefore, it is 2 times, and each phi must have a dimension minus a half. Now it will work. So I found that the dimension of phi is minus a half. Let's now do the calculation for lambda. What is the dimension for lambda? The answer is 
variation of s equals, and what I'm now going to do is an infinitesimal variation. That means one field phi, and here I replace by phi plus delta phi. And then I subtract the original action. So if you want to be very precise, I write that s function of phi plus delta phi, lambda plus delta lambda, I subtract the action of phi and lambda, and I go, I get something plus another term is two epsilon. Let me write it epsilon squared. That's a strange thing because epsilon was an anti number, so the square is zero. But I, what I mean is I only look at terms linear and epsilon. I'm going to do the calculation with you honestly, explicitly, and we'll see whether it comes in the law. And then I say that the first order variation of the action is zero. Now, these symmetries form an algebra. And you can formally define groups by writing in the exponent generators multiplied by integers and numbers again. The generators are also anti-commuting. So we are not going to discuss that group structure at all, but it doesn't fit. So let me now work out what the variation of S is. So first of all, S is an integral dt. But I'm not varying t. I'm going to vary fields. This is a wonderful point of confusion. Some people say you should also transform the coordinates. In physics, we call that active and passive transformations. And then the people who want mechanics, they write whole chapters on that. But my point of view is here. I define my variational rule that they only vary fields. Now, the first term is a half phi dot. So I have two phi dots I can vary. And since they commute, it doesn't matter which I take. If I multiply the row, they two and I vary one. That's the answer. So I get two terms a half and one. One phi dot I don't vary. And the second phi, I vary according to the law. But when I vary the phi dot, I take the dvt of this result. And the phi dot is the dvt of phi. So the dvt on this thing is that i, epsilon, and the dvt on lambda, as we discussed, I denote by lambda t dot. Then, I must vary the second term, this term. But I have two terms, and now they don't look the same. You have a lambda and a lambda dot. So I'll do each separate. If I vary this lambda, I get i over 2. And then the variation of lambda, I substitute this rule. Oh, by the way, you'll see that the right answer is this. So, uh, you'll see that. But I'll write already the right result. So minus. And then phi dot t times epsilon, we we'll also write it as epsilon phi dot t compute, times this lambda dot of t. <laughs> and then finally there's the third term that is interfering this lambda dot of t, so that is plus i over 2 lambda of t, ddt of, and then I write the variation of lambda, which is minus epsilon phi dot of t. Then I write here a bracket, I'll write it here, there's a DDT, a DT. Now, the next thing, you would only see a very, but if I would let this DDT act here, you would get that phi is two derivatives, and there's no other term as phi is two derivatives. So it's very natural to partially integrate. So now using the rules for partial integration with respect to T, as they are in the usual approach, you can justify these rules, as I said, with this constant approach, for example or the formal approach, or any other way. But for me, I follow the same rules of partial differentiation back to ordinary coordinates as in the usual case. So I partially integrate this term. And to save time, I'm going to do on board, I will write the dvt here and I write the minus sign. And I, but I will keep the surface term, it will be important. So when I partially integrate this term, then I get one term that is the total derivative dt of, and then I have the lambda of t minus epsilon phi dot of t. This is the total derivative. And then you get the second term where the dt sits here with a minus sign by partial integration, which cancel this minus sign. So you have plus i over 2 lambda dot of t, then epsilon phi dot. These are the variations. So you see at this point, so this term I will stretch out because I partially integrated it. Now,
these two terms add. I don't know if you can see that. There's a minus i over 2 in front, but an epsilon lambda dot here. There's a plus i over 2 here, but lambda, and lambda dot and epsilon are interchanged. And since the Grossman pair was explained, if you write it like this, you have an extra minus sign. So since this term is the same as this term, I will stretch this term out and multiply this term by 2. Now, this is the harm of what I'm doing. And, uh, at some point, the attention span cannot stay stretched all the time. But here, at this moment, I'm doing really the non-trivial thing, so you should pay attention. So I will erase this term and multiply this by 2. Next, I observe that these two terms cancel each other. Is that obvious? Because I have here plus i in front, here I have um, minus i in front. And they both have epsilon lambda dot in this same order. So plus the term and minus the same term. So they go. They cancel each other. So the result is only total derivative. Now here comes a very subtle point. I will assume at this point I'm left. And that is what people always do a few theory. That at plus and minus t, well, at t is plus or minus infinity, all fields vanish. So I will say that phi t, phi t is plus or minus infinity, the field phi is zero, and I will also, for these abstract Grossman variables, make the same assumption. At this point I will not need it, well, in some sense I need it, because I have a product here. So, the integral of the total derivative is the value of the integral the total derivative at the boundaries, at plus or minus infinity. If phi of t and this derivative go sufficiently fast to zero, this goes to zero, and if this also goes to zero, the product goes to zero. So the boundary term vanishes. So in fact, if you accept that, that is my definition. So under these definitions, I see that, that delta s is zero, which means that in our simple toy model, we have shown that there's a symmetry. Namely, if I vary the action under infinitesimal variations written down here, then the variation of the action, which I went step by step with it through it, transforms into a derivative, but with a sufficient potent boundary condition, the boundary term vanishes, and the action is really invariant. We call this a symmetry. So, okay. yeah. so let me then say what I do tomorrow. We have seen in the term simplest term model that is invariant on a rigid supersymmetry. Tomorrow I will use transparency one again. So this calculation I've done with you on the backward, and in the notes you can find all the details again. Now to give you a taste of what's coming tomorrow. I'm going to look at the transformation, two such transformations, both from phi and from lambda, and I will see that these two in translation over the distance which is given here. So tomorrow I'm going to say one translation goes from here to here, that's the constant translation, everything. And then I'm going to make this round of epsilon, which I had there, local, that is to say, function of t. Then I have the translation at this point over three meters, here over an inch, here over a long distance. And physicists call it a general to orbit transformation, and less efficient to do that too. And then I'm going to invoke the statement that Einstein in 1916 realized that there was a deep connection between general to orbit transformation on the one hand side and the physical force of gravitation on the other hand. And I will use that to see that if you have two local supersymmetry transformations, these will be supergravity transformations. The commutate of two such symmetry transformations leads to a general coordinate transformation. And a general coordinate transformation will lead to the force of gravity. And then I will discuss with you why the force of gravity comes out of a very simple algebra of Grossman variables. So general relativity is no longer a thing you postulate, but is a consequence of something deeper, a certain confirming component. Now, I realize I've gone very slow today, but this was the first lecture. Uh, and I, when I came here, I heard that there had been some journalism in the other lecture hall. Somebody said to me, well, the mathematics of you'll never know who 